almost ready to get spooked. Because today's story will do just that to you. So back in 1946, in the Texarkana area, there was a mysterious villain dubbed the Phantom Slayer who just ran around snuffing people left and right. Super quickly, too. Over the course of 10 weeks, the Phantom Slayer whacked five people and attacked eight in total. The creep was known for going specifically after couples and would apparently do all this while wearing a white mask or sack with holes cut for eyes. See, I told you it was creepy. So Texarkana is a bit of an interesting and confusing area. It's made up of the twin cities, Texarkana, Texas, and Texarkana, Arkansas. Like, they really couldn't think of two separate names. All you really need to know is that Texarkana was a good old rural southern town where nothing crazy really happened until 1946. Let's get to it. On February 22nd, a 25-year-old dude named Jimmy was trying to stunt on his 19-year-old girlfriend Mary by taking her out to a drive-in theater. After the flick, Jimmy drove his girl to a secluded area right off Richmond Road in Texarkana to chill before taking her home. This area was known as the local lover's lane where all the couples would just go sit in their car and chat. It's the 1940s version of Netflix and chill, if you will. Drive in and chill. So Jimmy and Mary were just sitting there in a parked car enjoying each other's company. And these two lovebirds were pretty young and probably still in the honeymoon phase, so we can just assume they weren't really aware of what was going on around them. Well, whether it was out of nowhere or the couple was just way too distracted to see it coming, some random guy just popped out. It looked like the man was wearing a sort of white mask or like a pillowcase with eye holes or something. And this went down in February, so it definitely wasn't a bootleg Halloween costume. The creepy dude came up to the car, glared a flashlight in Jimmy and Mary's eyes. He then grabbed a firearm and demanded the couple to exit the car. Obviously, they complied and started getting out. After Jimmy stepped out of the car, the dude told him to take off his pants, or in rural Texarkana terms, his britches. Then he proceeded to pistol whip Jimmy, which meant the perp literally hit Jimmy with this pistol instead of actually firing it. So I guess Mr. Pillowcase was either working up the courage to use the weapon the way it was intended, or he didn't want to let Jimmy off that easy and instead decided to torment him a bit. Either way, it's weird. Like, either get some bullets going or smack the dude with another tool. After Jimmy hit the ground, the hooded man smacked Mary across the head with his pistol and told her to run away. What is this man doing? First, he's not using his handheld the right way, and now he's telling his victim to run? I'm all for her getting away and surviving this attack, but does this guy know that means he would probably be ratted out to the cops and arrested? Anyway, Mary started to escape, but she was wearing heels, and if you've ever run in heels before, you know that it's a broken ankle waiting to happen, so you kinda have to move a bit slower. Yeah, running in heels always slows me down. It didn't take long for the masked man to catch up to her and hit her over the head again, which caused her to fall. After that, the dude did something super vulgar to her with his pistol before he was scared away by an oncoming car. Jimmy and Mary were then rushed to the hospital and they somehow both ended up surviving all of that. Which like, how? The couple talked to the cops about their run-in with the villain, but they were the opposite of helpful when it came to identifying who he actually was. Mary claimed the dude was black and Jimmy swore he was white, but both mentioned he was about six feet tall and had a white mask on with eye and mouth holes. So if this dude was wearing a full on mask the whole time, it seems like Jimmy and Mary were both just shooting out made up ideas about the color of this man just to see if they'd land. About a month later, the masked man went after another young couple at Lover's Lane. One March night, 29-year-old Richard and his 17-year-old girlfriend Polly were just chilling in a parked car at the iconic couple's hotspot when their lives abruptly ended. We don't know much about what actually went down that night because these victims didn't survive. They were found the next morning slumped over in Richard's car with multiple wounds. Richard was hit with two bullets and Polly looked like she was physically violated before getting knocked in the head with a bullet as well. At the scene of the crime, there was a patch of red fluid near the car, so officials theorized that the two were slain outside of the vehicle, and once the deed was done, the perp put them back inside. Is that part not strange? Like, I would get it if the man was trying to stage it to look like the couple passed away due to some car-related incident, but it was so clear they were targeted because they literally had bullet wounds. So why would he just leave them like that? Well, in true Texas fashion, it rained that night, so there weren't any footprints that detectives could find. But they did discover some ammo nearby that belonged to a 32 caliber Colt. A few days after the incident, the police posted a $500 reward for anyone who could provide information about the crime that would lead to an arrest. And everyone and their mother started calling in and being like, I saw the guy. He was super creepy and had a weapon. By the way, here's my Venmo for the reward. Well, obviously Venmo wasn't a thing back then, but what I'm trying to get at is all of Texarkana started calling in these false leads in hopes to get some coin. And while investigators tried to find out who this man was, he was already plotting his next stint, which took place around three weeks after Jimmy and Mary's big adieu. So one Saturday night in April, this cute little 15-year-old saxophone player named Betty had a performance with her band, the Rhythm Airs. 
That night, Paul, Betty's longtime friend and possible boyfriend, we're not quite sure what their status was, he came to pick her up after the gig, which took place at none other than a VFW hall. Because, you know, Texas. Also, I love that this chick is out there living her best band dreams, playing a gig at 15. You go, girl. I used to play band back in middle school. I played the flute, but kind of gave up on that, that dream of mine. Anyway, Paul picked up Betty and decided to make a pit stop at Spring Lake Park before taking her home. And boy, was that decision bad. At around 6.30 the next morning, Paul was found lifeless on the side of the road covered in bullet wounds. He looked super rough, too. One of the bullets went through the back of his neck and came out the front of his head. But Betty was nowhere to be found. Shortly after that connection was made, a search began. And hours later, Betty was discovered behind a tree. She was lying on her back and had her right hand in the pocket of her coat that was buttoned all the way up to her chin. Now, this happened in Texas during the spring, so it was already super weird that this girl had a jacket on to begin with, but for it to be buttoned all the way to the top, that was like super sus. Like Paul, Betty was knocked out with bullets, but she was found about two miles away from where Paul's corpse was located. And the car was found even further away with the keys still in the ignition. So how did all of that happen? Well, detectives really didn't know, but they were certain this crime was connected to the previous two because not only were the victims and crime scenes similar across the board, the weapon used in all three instances were the same, a 32 caliber pistol. Once the story of Betty and Paul hit the news, the people of Texarkana absolutely lost their marbles. I mean, they were already going berserk from the two previous crimes, but by the time this one surfaced, people were so freaked out by the idea that there was a terrifying criminal on the loose in their small town that they took some extreme security precautions. Local stores started selling out of ammo and firearms. People began sleeping with loaded pistols on each side of the bed. Women checked into hotels with their kids when their husbands were away on work trips. Others made pallets on the floor for their children to sleep next to them. And some people even jerry-rigged their own security systems by connecting pots and pans to wires that strung the line of their property. So they were the dictionary definition of committed. So there were also a few teens in the area who decided to take matters and in their own hands since the cops weren't really doing much. These teens started posting up in their car near Lover's Lane to try and lure the villain out. One night, a deputy found a couple all cozy in their car on a desolate road, so he got out and asked if they were scared of being out there with everything that's been going on. The girl then told him, you're the one who ought to be scared, mister. It's a good thing you told me who you are. I was ready for the killer. And that's when she flashed him her pistol. Which like, this girl sounds like such a boss, but I also think she should have chilled it with a firearm considering she was talking to a cop. Not only were civilians frightened by this man, but the authorities were too, because after Betty and Paul slang, a voluntary curfew was put in place for businesses. The idea behind a voluntary curfew is so interesting to me. Like, hey y'all, there's a savage man on the loose who strikes young couples at night and we don't know what he's capable of, so you should probably just close early just in case. But most people seem to follow the curfew because everyone was terrified. And they had every right to be. I mean, in less than two months, four people have been brutally executed and two others were badly injured. This was also before the days when people knew it was possible for one person to carry out so many slings, so it was a hard concept to wrap their brains around. Nowadays, it's almost a norm. Ted Bundy, Richard Ramirez, Jeff Dahmer, you know, those types of people. So by this point, this mysterious masked man has whacked so many people that he needed a nickname. And that's when the Texarkana Daily News published the article with the heading, Phantom Killer Eludes Officers as Investigation of Slayings Pressed. One day later, I guess the Texarkana Gazette was salty they missed the press release, so they printed their own article about the incidents with the title, Phantom Slayer Still at Large as Probe Continues. And from then on out, the villain was dubbed the Phantom Killer or the Phantom Slayer. After the perp got his dope new nickname, he decided to make sure everyone knew it because he pounced on his next victims. But this time, he switched things up a bit. Instead of going after his usual young crowd, the Phantom Slayer decided to pick on someone his own age. Well, actually, we don't know how old this dude was. I just wanted to use that saying. Anyway, here's what happened. On May 3rd, 37-year-old Virgil Starks was kicking back in his ranch-style home listening to his favorite radio station while his wife Katie was lounging upstairs. Katie thought she heard something, so she asked Virgil to turn the volume down, and seconds later she heard shots coming through the window. Katie rushed down the stairs to find her husband, who was literally standing up with streams of fluid running down his body. Seconds later, Virgil fell back in his chair and took his last breath. Katie, who was panicked to say the least, ran to the phone to call 911. But before she could dial those three numbers, she was interrupted by two bullets that hit her in the face. Even though she couldn't see and was in so much pain, Katie somehow got up and grabbed the firearm that she and Virgil casually kept in their living room. 
She knew the intruder was coming for her neck, so instead of trying to fight him by blindly aiming her weapon, she chose the flight option and ran for her life. Good move, Katie. Katie sprinted to her sister's house, but no one was home, so she had to run to her neighbor's house down the street. Thankfully, her neighbor was home and they were able to call the cops who pulled up to the scene as quickly as they could. Katie miraculously survived the attack, but she did lose a few teeth along her run since one of the bullets hit her pearly whites. Once investigators arrived at the scene, they found a flashlight, unidentified red footprints, and bullet shells. But this time, the shells were from a 22 caliber pistol instead of a 32. Even still, everything else matched up with the Phantom Slayer's MO, so detectives connected this attack to all of the others. Hey. The dude could have just run out of ammo for his favorite handheld, or maybe you want to try to shake things up a bit and try to confuse people with a new weapon? Either way, no one else was going around Texarkana rubbing people out like that, so it was clear it was the same perp. Virgil, in Katie's case, was the last alleged crime performed by the Phantom Slayer, but even after three of his eight victims survived to tell their stories, his identity remained unknown to this day. Of the hundreds of suspects detectives have pursued over the years, here are the most popular ones. First up is Yule Swinney. This guy was first theorized to be the Phantom when an Arkansas trooper was sifting through car theft reports and noticed something strange. That a car had been stolen by Yule every night the Phantom Slayer attacked. A few weeks after that was discovered, some farmer was like, yo, my tenant isn't paying rent and I'm living. Here's his name and license plate number. Can y'all do something? Well, I'm sure you've guessed it, but that tenant was Yule. As for the car, it was apparently stolen the same weekend Richard and Polly were whacked. That June, an Arkansas police officer was out and about when he noticed a car in the parking lot that had been reported as stolen. He waited in the area until someone came back to the car so he could arrest them, and lo and behold, Yule's wife Peggy came strolling up to the stolen car. The officer pulled her aside to ask a few questions, which is when she told him her husband was in another town trying to sell another car that he had stolen. After a bit of a chase, officials were able to track down Yule. They arrested him and brought him in for questioning, and during his interviews, Yule made a few comments that definitely hinted at him being more than just a car thief. When Peggy was informed about the allegation that her husband was the Phantom, she apparently said, how did they find out? She then went on to tell officials that she believed Yule was indeed the Phantom Slayer, but after Peggy spilled the beans, she took back her statement and refused to testify against her husband in court. So, aside from Peggy's wishy-washy claims and Yule's weird commentary, here are a few other reasons why most people believe the car thief was actually a mass executioner. The car Peggy was driving the day she was stopped was the one that was reported missing on the night of Robert and Polly Slanks. Yule owned a 32 caliber Colt that he had just sold in a game of craps. There was a shirt found in Yule's room that said Stark on it when held under a black light, and if you don't remember, Stark was Virgil and Katie's last name. In the front pocket of the shirt, there were samples of metal that matched materials found at Virgil's welding shop. And last, but certainly not least, members of Peggy and Yule's family outright said they thought Yule was the Phantom Slayer. So, seems pretty obvious that Yule is our guy, but there are always two sides to every story. Here's why he might not be the infamous Texarkana Phantom. His fingerprints didn't match any of the samples found at the various crime scenes. He kind of had an alibi during one of the slangs. His wife took back her whole claim that he was the criminal, and a few officials assigned to the case just had a feeling it wasn't Yule. Another confusing element of the story is there was a 21-year-old girl who disappeared from Texarkana in 1948. Most people believe this case was related to the Phantom Slayer, but by that point, Yule was already in prison for stealing cars. In 1978, Yule was released after serving 41 years of his car-stealing sentence, and he passed away in 1994. Since he's never confessed to the slings himself or been connected by solid evidence, he left this world a free man. In 1999 and 2000, there was some unknown chick that started calling surviving family members of the Phantom's victims to apologize for what her father had done. Yule never had a daughter, so maybe she was hinting at someone else. Over the course of the investigation, a few other suspects have been tossed around, including some college kid who took his own life and left behind a series of contradicting notes, claiming he was the Phantom Slayer and then taking it all back. As sketchy as that sounds, there was no evidence tying the teen to the crime, his bill didn't match the description of the perp, and his friend even came forward claiming they wrote those suspicious notes as a joke. Yo, they were literally asking to get arrested. Like, what the heck kind of hangout is that? Hey dude, you want to come over and write a bunch of incriminating letters with me? It'll be super rad. After filtering through all possible suspects, officials were still never able to determine the true identity of the Phantom Slayer. Now it's been over 70 years and no one knows who this guy was or why he suddenly stopped going after the people of Texarkana. 
Apparently they aren't that pressed though because every Halloween the 1970s movie inspired by these acts is shown at a Texarkana park near one of the crime scenes. Well that's one way to cope. Just make a movie about it and then play it every year in hopes that the dangerous villain never returns. You know, a part of me thinks that maybe he went after all these couples because he had relationship troubles himself and he must have found himself a new boo which is why he suddenly stopped. Honestly, that's the only thing that makes sense to me at this point. Well, aside from eating this barbecue tofu sandwich. That makes sense too. So I'm gonna dig in while it's hot and I'll catch you soon.